Welcome to Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Star's daily sports podcast. It's Tuesday, April 7th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. The day after college basketball's national championship game would have been played, we stick with the sport on today's episode. Kansas State is coming off a last place Big 12 finish, so what better time to turn over the roster? That's what Bruce Weber and staff are doing, and K-State beat writer Kellis Robinette tells us who's coming in, who's transferring out, and what the impact of all of this could have on next season. After a break, you'll hear from one of the nation's top sports columnists, Barry Trammell of The Oklahoman. Barry joined The Oklahoman in 1991, and his newspaper career started some 13 years earlier in his hometown of Norman. Nobody knows sports in Oklahoma better than Barry, and I wanted to get his thoughts about Oklahoma State coaching legend Eddie Sutton getting voted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. That announcement came on Saturday. It was clearly the right call, Barry and I agree, but he believes Sutton waited much too long to enter. But first, we jump in with Callis Robinette, who said he was caught off guard a little bit by the decision of David Sloan to transfer from Kansas State. The thought at the time was David Sloan uh, was going to be back as a senior point guard, and they really wanted to add a, a wing with their final scholarship. So it was a little bit surprising to see that they didn't go that route and brought in a uh, junior college point guard. But lo and behold, the reason was because they they knew Sloan was on the way out. So basically, they re- replaced one uh, junior college point guard with another junior college point guard. Uh, even more interesting, both of these guys – happened to lead the, all of junior colleges in assists in back-to-back years. So it's kind of funny. They they basically said, well, we're losing uh, junior college transfer point guard after one year. Let's go out and find his uh, closest replacement. Um, but he, the, uh, Rudy Williams does seem like a, a talented player and a possible nice late addition for the Wildcats. He averaged 21 points, almost nine assists, and even rebounded the ball a little bit at uh, Northeast Oklahoma A&M Junior College last season. And as I said, he led the country in assists. He's pretty good at scoring uh, with the ball and distributing. So you never know with junior college players. Um, it's a totally different game, totally different uh, you know, style of play once you get into the Big 12. But if you're going to add somebody late in the process, he seems like an okay, okay option. And am I jumping the gun to assume he will be the starting point guard next year? Or um, it, did you think it was that part of the the selling pitch by Bruce Weber? Well, it was certainly part of the selling pitch for him. I think he'll get every opportunity to start at point guard. Um, but I wouldn't underestimate Nigel Pack uh, coming in from Indianapolis as a uh, true freshman for Kansas State next season. He was the very first person they recruited over the summer. Um, a four-star guy. He can score. He's got a lot of talent. He's just not quite as old as Rudy Williams. So I think it'll be a interesting competition between those two guys. Right now, I would actually lean a little bit toward Pack just because he's been involved with Kansas State longer. But as I mentioned, he'll be two years younger. Never know how that goes. Either way, you're going to see both of them play. Why didn't it work out with David Sloan? As you said, he came in, you know, with some, some good numbers from from junior college. Started a little bit, I, I noticed, but uh, why why didn't it work out with him? Yeah, it's an interesting deal. He's the one guy out of everybody who's who's left this off season. He's the one guy who I think you can actually say, okay, I didn't see that coming. Um, and I'm not exactly sure why that is. the The best reason I can give is just that his role in the team was never totally. Um, defined. I think he he started the year as their backup point guard, and then late in the year was their starting point guard. And then all of a sudden he was back to their backup point guard, and he his playing style was just so much different from guys like Cartier Jada and Sean Neal Williams when when he was here early in the, in the season. And I don't know that it just ever quite clicked as to what they wanted him to do with the offense as opposed to the other two guys. David Sloan's more of a distributor. Um, and when he does score, it's just right at the rim when he has some some fast break opportunities, whereas the other guys who were playing were more create uh, jump shots off the dribble and lead the offense that way. So uh, and he's also, you know, he's from Louisville. He's not all that close to here. And I, I feel like if uh, the coronavirus pandemic hadn't come down on us, he probably would have returned next season. But to go home. And, uh, you know, spent all this time around friends and family who probably had a bunch of questions for him as why his his uh, first season at Kansas State wasn't a, a big success. Um, 
I'm sure just sit, going home and hearing a bunch of that made him think, you know what, maybe I can find a better situation. And uh, I don't know where he'll end up. He's, uh, you know, he, he's already transferred in here. So he, wherever he goes, he'll have to sit out another, he'll have to sit out a year before he goes and plays anywhere. But um, he's a good kid and I wish him best of luck. That, that's interesting that you think maybe the, uh, the, the COVID might have something to do with him, him leaving. That's, there's probably more of that happening in in college sports than look. There's there's a lot of issues right now in college sports with um, eligibility of of the spring semester athletes for next year, and I imagine that's got to factor into some the minds of some college athletes maybe wanting to be closer to home. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But if this is the first time I've heard of that for for a college player. So well, yeah, I mean, think guy? about it. If he was if he was here, if this wasn't going on, he'd be on campus right now practicing. They'd probably be telling him, you know, you're going to be our starting point guard next year. We're going to be leaning on you. There'd be a whole lot less reason to transfer. Yeah, for sure. Hey, we haven't talked since um, Cartier Jada found a destination, and, um, and that is Virginia Tech. What is, um, you know, I think at the time when when Jada announced that he wasn't returning to Kansas State, there was a little bit of thought that, okay, uh, he's he's just done with college basketball. Maybe uh, not not a player that's going to get drafted, but somebody who could make some money playing perhaps overseas, and or or maybe um, G League. But uh, but the fact that he ended up at Virginia Tech, tell us about how that happened. Well, basically, the obvious connection is that Chester Fraser, who used to be an assistant coach and recruited him at Kansas State, is now working at Virginia Tech. So uh, that's really the only thing I can see. It's a little bit closer to his home in South Carolina as well. So maybe that played into it. But I think he is still planning on trying to go pro. Um, he's at least going to test the waters and see how things go. I don't know what exactly he'll be, you know, what he'll need to to learn to decide to make the plunge and turn pro versus go to Virginia tech, but he's leaving that door open. Um, I think, I think the coronavirus played a role in this too. I, I think if you were looking at a normal pre-draft process where he knew he would be getting workouts and traveling around and talking to people, then maybe he'd have a little bit more confidence going that route. But with all of this uncertainty, you know, like, like you just mentioned, he's not, it's very unlikely he's going to be a draft pick. I don't know that he can even convince anybody to make a G League roster right now without trying out with, uh, in front of people. So it makes his path a little bit more difficult, and I think that's one reason why he decided, you know what, um, maybe college basketball is worth looking at for one more season. Okay, let's talk about uh, the, the, the uh, with, with Sloan leaving, that opens up a scholarship, and Kansas State is in the market, and they are a finalist for Donovan Williams. And that would be a terrific get if uh, if Bruce Weber would land Donovan Williams. What tell me about this guy? Uh, he's exactly what they need, not only for their final scholarship, but if you were trying to start a recruiting class with somebody, he'd be a guy you'd say, "Wow, uh, he's a very nice addition. He's a rivals top fifty guy, four star player. Um, he averaged over thirty points playing." for a high school in Lincoln last year, Mr. Mr. Basketball, Nebraska. And the thing that makes him so appealing to Kansas State is he knows how to score. Um, he can get to the rim. He can create his own shot. He's good at free throws. He's a little iffy from the three-point line, so that's one reason why maybe he only has three scholarships and um, a bunch of schools like Kansas and Villanova, who, who did look at him and uh, – like Kansas brought him in on two unofficial visits, but never actually pulled the trigger on a scholarship. That might be one reason why he didn't have a little bit more attention, but especially right now, given the circumstances, um, he would be by far the best possible player that they could add. And for him, it comes down to Kansas state, Oklahoma state and Texas. He's visited K state. He's visited Oklahoma state. Uh, it makes me think those are the two favorites and he's committing on Monday and uh, he's definitely the guy they want. Okay, he's a six five, I think, six five wing kind of a guy. Right, yeah, he's a, he's a wing player. You could put him a shooting guard, small forward. He would be a, a good candidate to come in and maybe replace Xavier Sneed next season. Okay, you know, for for a team coming off a, a last place finish and no a, a number ten seed in in the conference tournament, although they did win their conference tournament opener, but for a team coming off of the type of season that Kansas State had last year, it's it's a good time to start over, isn't it? Don't you think it's, if you're ever going to do it, now's the time to kind of 
clear the roster and bring in new new blood and just start over. And there is some history here with Bruce Weber doing that at Kansas State. Yeah, definitely. Um, the last time he did it was um, – they didn't finish last that season, but it was the the year where things got real chaotic with uh, Marcus Foster and um, Bruce Weber decided to basically reshuffle the deck and hit the reset button. And uh, he he brought in seven new players that season and people thought, oh, my goodness, this is, uh, you know, unprecedented. But it worked out for him. He, it allowed him to bring in Barry Brown, Dean Wade and Kamau Stokes and rebuild. And that led to some good things down the line. Um, we'll see if they can do it again this time. It's kind of interesting to look at. There's really not much outrage about eight players leaving, which is funny because that's actually one more than the last time when it happened. Um, but just uh, a lot of these guys were expected to leave. So I think that's why there's no, why it's not all that surprising. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, clearly the, the path they were taking last season, uh, wasn't, wasn't all that great. So if you're gonna, gonna start over now is probably the time. Right, right. Okay, Callis. Hey, great catching up, and we will talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks so much, Blair. Hey, it's Blair. Hey, we have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners, unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Star's award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns we have to offer. And it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. For your convenience your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at 50 bucks, unless you tell us to cancel. A lot of subscription services won't tell you that. They'll just sneak it on there. We just told you. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Barry Trammell got to the Oklahoma at about the same time Eddie Sutton returned to coach his alma mater for the 1990-91 season. And Barry was there for so many of the Cowboys' big moments, like the final four runs of 1995 and 2004. We talk about Sutton's long overdue entry into the Naismith Hall of Fame, and Barry opens by suggesting as much as the news was welcome and appreciated, there might have been a bit of a sour taste. It still came with some with some bitter aspects, um, you know, three, three things come to my mind. One is Eddie's 84 years old and how much he's able to enjoy this is really sort of up for interpretation. Um, you know, he's no longer communicative in terms of being able to speak. Um, he, his son's hope, that he understands that they believe he understands, but they don't know for sure. So that's a little bit of a bummer. Uh, number two is, and you know, this Blair, um, Eddie was great to be around just talking basketball. He, he loved sure. to love to tell stories about, you know, people throughout the NCAA tournament history that he experienced talking about Henry Iba, talking about former players, everybody from, from Sydney Moncrief to big country. So uh, he was such a great storyteller. And to, to picture him up on the stage in Springfield, you know, s- receiving this honor, that was a, that, that's a sort of a nice thought. Uh, and it's not going to happen. Somebody else will have to accept for Eddie. And, and then uh, lastly, uh, Patsy, his great partner, his wife of 54 years, she died in 2013, I think it was. So she's not here to enjoy it. So, yeah, it's great. It's, you know, he, he's certainly uh, he's certainly uh, qualified, but it, it does come with some bittersweet aspects of why it took so long. I'll tell you, I, I was getting to the point where I didn't know if it was ever going to happen. I, I can remember being at the Final Four in Minneapolis last year, and not that the voting occurred at a time that this could have been anticipated, but how perfect would it have been you know, for last year to have ended the long wait with Texas Tech in the championship at the Final Four, and then into the championship game with Sean Sutton on the bench for the Red Raiders, and then Sidney Moncrief going in 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 with that class a year ago. I just thought if there was, and I remember talking to Sidney Moncrief about it up in Minneapolis. If if there was ever a time for Eddie to to have gone into the Hall of Fame, maybe one last good opportunity. It would have been 2019, but it's 2020, and it is—it does happen. Look, I was—I 
I can remember long uh, up 20 years ago almost i thought eddie was qualified to to go into the hall of fame and and look there are well stated reasons that i've heard arguments against eddie in the hall of fame the the um you know it was about with alcoholism although i don't think that should disqualify anybody from any kind of honor but the the way things ended at kentucky for him certainly was had to have been a consideration for the reluctance on the part of the voters over the years yeah i mean i it's got to be some combination of those two things. Um, one problem you've got with the Basketball Hall of Fame is it's a little bit of anonymous voting. It's sort of a shadowy process. When we look at the other halls of fame that we know so well, um, you know, Cooperstown and Canton, uh, even the College Football Hall of Fame, which is mostly done through chapters of the National Football Foundation. Then you get into the Basketball Hall of Fame, and they've got two processes. They have a nominating committee, and then they have an honors committee that sort of ratifies somebody in. We really don't know much about that about that uh, body. And right. if you, what I've told Oklahoma State people, and you know, they're the ones. OSU people are the ones that have been really gotten militant over the years and angry. And I said, listen, the College Basketball Hall of Fame in Kansas City, they put. They put it in years ago. I can't remember in which class he was, but he went in one of the first classes. Uh, right. he, was, he was one of the early entries into that thing, and that's the people that know college basketball best. The, the Springfield has a problem, and it's not anybody's fault, but you know when you're, when you're talking about uh, candidates who coached college basketball in the United States, you know, they're, they're sort of jousting for position with uh, European players from the Soviet Union in the 1970s or, or uh, European coaches uh, who pioneered the sport. Or, you know, it's just such a, it's just such a wide-ranging uh, Hall of Fame that it can be difficult to, uh, to really narrow down solid parameters. But I come back to this. Forget all of that. Forget the forget the Europeans. Forget the women's aspect. Forget everything. Forget the NBA. Just look at college basketball coaches who were in Springfield, Massachusetts, and Eddie Sutton clearly belongs in that class. I mean, I I might be wrong about this, but I think years ago I looked it up. I think there I think there are two St. John's coaches in the Hall of Fame who collectively don't have as many wins as Eddie Sutton. <laughs> <laughs> Luke Carter second, Frank Lapchick. So it's um, you know it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of an east. And when it comes to college basketball, it's a little bit of an eastern bias. I think that's lessening over the years, but that's really where it, sort of the roots of the Hall of Fame were. So you know Eddie's from Western Kansas, uh, played in Stillwater, Oklahoma, did his best work in Stillwater and Fayetteville. He's not a child of the East. The only thing he ever did East is. Every time they put him in a regional out there, he went to the final four. But, uh, you know, he's just, he didn't really fit geographically. I don't know that it's anybody's fault, but it's nice that he got in. But, man, uh, it'd been nice if he could have enjoyed it a little more. Right. Let's talk about a couple of those teams. I, um, I, I picked up Eddie in, in the 70s when he was at Arkansas. I know that he took Creighton to the NCAA tournament for the first time in, in quite a while, but then he parlayed that into the Arkansas job and the triplets with, uh, with Moncrief and Brewer and Delph and just a fantastic team in 1978 and parlayed that into the Kentucky job where it fell apart for him, sat out a year, got, gets to Oklahoma State as alma mater, and it just immediate immediate success. I believe this is right, Barry. Didn't he inherit Byron Houston at Oklahoma State? He inherited Byron Houston, and he actually, Leonard Hamilton left him a nice a nice yes. stockpile of talent, uh, and he always credited Leonard for that. You know, Leonard Hamilton's underrated for his recruiting. In a, in a two-year span in Stillwater, he recruited five players who eventually made the NBA. Now, that's unheard of now. It was unheard of then. The problem was Leonard never really got him coalesced into any kind of a good team. Leonard never made the NCAA tournament in his four years, but he, he left behind Corey Williams, who played for the Chicago Bulls, 
Uh, Johnny Pittman was a good center. Um, Darwin Alexander was a solid guard. And then you put those with Byron Houston, who was a big-time player. Eddie had a lot to work with. Of course, he had Sean coming with him. Sean was an excellent point guard. So Eddie took over a team that was ready to win, and he was ready to teach them how to win, and they did it immediately. They lost in the Sweet 16. Uh, Corey Williams hit a shot in the last few seconds that looked like a three-pointer. Um Would have tied the game. Turns out his foot was on the line. Cowboys lose by one to Temple. But uh, they were off and running. And for 15 and a half seasons, uh, Oklahoma State basketball was about as good as anybody. They didn't win at the consistently high levels of Kansas. But in that time, they won two big big eight or big 12 titles. They won uh, two big 12 tournaments. Or uh, I'm sorry, three, 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 three and one, three, one, one big eight, two big twelve, and right. two final fours. So exactly, you know, it's just an incredible run for a school that has not, you know, not since 1953 done much in basketball. And I remember that '95 Final Four team that uh, they came to Kansas City and Kemper won the Big Twelve tournament, got to the NCAA with uh, with Bryant Reeves, Big Country, and Randy Rutherford, and in a succession of victories in March defeated Antonio McDice in Alabama, Tim Duncan with Wake Forest and Marcus Camby at UMass. And uh, I believe John Calipari was the coach to get to the first final four there. That was, that was an incredible run where I think Bryant Reeves made a lot of money for himself on, on that particular run. And then in 04, of course they beat St. Joe and at East Rutherford, uh, to get to the second Final Four, that was the team with Joey Graham, the Graham brothers, and then Tony Allen and, and John Lucas. And um, uh, neither team won a game at the Final Four, but they both got there. And I guess those you'd have to consider those the, the high points of the Eddie Sutton era at Oklahoma State. Oh yeah, you know, the, particularly '95, uh, they were a four seed. You know, they were good. We didn't know they were great. They go up to Allen Fieldhouse uh, at the end of the season with a chance to tie for the Big Eight title, and that's the game where the Jayhawks shut out Big Country. Didn't score. Yeah, Randy yes, Rutherford. Always, he had forty-five. Right, Randy Rutherford, Rutherford had, four, and, had forty-five <laughs> points. Uh, yeah, they com- Reeves and Rutherford combined for forty-five. Right. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know I remember so much about a day game, and I remember so much that Jayhawk fans at near the end of the game were chanting, "Reeves has zero. And it was, you know, not the, not the classiest, you know, chant of all time, but not, you know, it wasn't terribly rude because it was factually correct. I mean, here's an All-American center with zero points at the end of the game. And I remember Roy Williams walking out, you know, and putting his hands down, trying to get the crowd to uh, right. quieten down because he, he, he was really uh, he was really high on uh, – he, he liked Eddie, he liked the big country. But uh, they come back. Uh, you know, the next week in Kansas City and played great and uh, and um, win that tournament, and they were off to the races. It was a really good team, really put together four, um, four really good defenders, plus big country in the middle, who are you know, not the most adept of foot, but he's seven foot, 280 pounds, and he took up a lot of space. So exactly. they could really play defense, and they had some – Randy Rutherford could shoot, and big country could catch and turn and, and make eight-footers. Uh, on turnarounds, so uh, they got hot at the right time and, and just played great and went to the Final Four, uh, 62-61 with three minutes left, and UCLA uh, dominated the rest of the game. Um, but it, it, what it was, it, what, that was the culmination of the OSU renaissance in terms of this is really happening. Ed, we, we're really back in basketball. You know, Henry Iba was a great coach, but the last – really 15 years of, of Iba's career were not very good. He had one championship team, 65, and most of the time they were not. They were second division in the Big Eight. They were not very good. In the 70s were a dry hole. The 80s, not much going on. And literally for 30-something 30, for 30 years, Oklahoma State basketball was mostly forgotten. And Eddie got it back rip-roaring quickly and at a very high level. And you just said it a moment ago. He was a he was a classy gentleman. I just I know he didn't have much luck in in Lawrence over the years. I just I, I want to say it was his last game coaching 
maybe one of his last years coaching the Cowboys in in um, bringing his team up to Allen Fieldhouse. He had some pretty bitter losses in that building for sure. But um, I remember him shaking the hands of Kansas players uh, during that game. I want to say it was a, maybe a senior day, and he made sure to shake the hands of the Kansas players. And I just uh, he, you know what he. I had a really good relationship with him and, and I've always, always, I always appreciated that. He, you know, he was always kind to me and was uh, always took my calls and you remember things like that. He just, I just thought he was a very classy individual. Uh, you know, he, he liked, he liked the media and he liked, he liked writers. He called us scribes, you know, he, he sort of yeah. talked, he sort of talked in old, old language. Uh, so he, he, he'd call us scribes and, you know, in this, this day and age, even coaches I've known for 20 years, you got to go through protocol nowadays. You got to call the, you know, you got to call the PR guy, set something up. Um, and you, you don't have to, but if you don't, you're going to hear about it. and It's not worth the trouble. You never did that with Eddie. If you wanted to talk to Eddie Sutton, you called him and, uh, you know, he just answered the phone and would say, well, what do you need? So that was nice. And, um, Funny thing about Eddie Sutton, I can't for the life of me want I have a twin brother, and we grew up huge sports fans. And we loved college basketball, just loved it. And for some reason, we didn't like Eddie Sutton. I have no idea what, why we didn't like Eddie Sutton growing up. And, when he, and his Arkansas teams, we loved his Arkansas teams. You mentioned the 78 team with the triplets. You know, every time the Dallas Cowboys refer to Aikman, Emmett, and Irvin as the triplets, I literally go bananas because triplets, <laughs> we call people triplets because it's three alike and three of the same thing. There's nothing yeah. remotely alike about Troy Aikman, Emmett Smith, and, and, uh, and Michael Irvin. That's not a triplets. That's a trio. It's a bass, a soprano, and a tenor. That's not what Eddie Sutton had in Fayetteville. He had three guys, six foot four, that could handle the ball and could shoot and were quick and play defense. They were exactly alike, except he had three of them, and they were all uh, all-star caliber players. So we loved that Arkansas team. Uh, we were so happy when he went to Kentucky because we, th we hated Kentucky because they won so much, and we thought, you know, that's just one school we can, you know, Sutton can go coach Kentucky, and uh, we can uh, put all our hate on one, one area. And then, of course, he comes back to OSU, uh, you know, several years later. And uh, my first job at the Oklahoma in, in December of 1991, uh, I was hired to do the OSU beat. And OSU basketball was uh, my assignment. And I went up there to meet Eddie Sutton for the first time. He could not have been more gracious. He could not have been more uh, accommodating. He could not have been more welcoming. And literally for 30 years now, we've had a great relationship uh, sat on planes with him and um, just uh, listened to his stories. And uh, after after bitter defeats, whether it's the Final Four or the NCAA tournament, doesn't matter where it's at. When the season's over, he couldn't be more gracious and and introspective, and really had his priorities straight. It seemed to me. So uh, it's been a blessing in my career and my life to to get to cover Eddie Sutton. Um, so. You know, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled for his family because it was important to them, um, and I uh, and I'm hopeful that Eddie can that Eddie can enjoy this. Very good, Barry. Look, I really appreciate you spending some time with us talking about it, and uh, and I, I'm with you. I feel great for the Sutton family, and wish it had happened earlier, but it is happening. And uh, and congratulations to, to Eddie Sutton. So, Barry, thanks a lot, my friend. All right, see you later, Blair. That will do it for today. Thanks for listening and to the crew that puts together these episodes. Derek Donovan, Savannah Smith, Randy Mason, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, and Chris Fickett. Cap tip to K-State beat writer Kavis Robinette and Oklahoman columnist Barry Trammell for joining us today. Links to the stories they wrote that we talked about are in the show notes. Earlier in the show, you hear me shilling for a Sports Pass subscription, and that's a great offer but so is a digital subscription to all of the Kansas City Star's award-winning news and sports coverage. That can be yours by accessing account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. That's account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. 
We'll be back on Wednesday for another Sports Beat KC, where we talk sports in Kansas City every day.